So those are housekeeping things. Now it, it really is a pleasure to introduce Dr. Carroll, who's been a longtime friend and uh, really a longtime role model. So um, Dr. Carroll's got a few years on me, started out at the University of Chicago, and uh, then moved to University of Colorado. His interests have been things that we've all been following for a long time, some creative approaches to coronary angiography. And in the last decade, uh, Dr. Carroll has actually been the guy who spearheaded the formation of the TVT registry, which is the ACC STS registry of transvalvular, uh, transcatheter therapeutics. So uh, Dr. Carroll has a wealth of information. Dr. Carroll is one of the pioneers of percutaneous structural heart interventions. He's a co-author of the very first textbook on the topic and has really been the guy who's led the charge since the beginning. So um, John, come on up here. There's one other thing I'd like to say personally. Some of you know that I kind of like ice climbing. Now, John may not know this, but first time I went uh, vertical ice climbing was years ago when John invited me out to give grand rounds at his place. And that was my uh, first introduction to vertical ice. So John, professionally and personally, welcome. Hey. Thanks, Neil. Well, it's really a pleasure and an honor to be here. We had a nice dinner last night and uh, many old friends and new friends. And uh, so I'm going to talk about one of the controversies in, in TAVR that has pretty broad implications, uh, the volume outcome relationship. So just so those of you who may not know, this is a, a, a CU mascot, the bison. Uh, which was almost completely wiped out, but now it's being raised and it's uh, actually a, a competitor to beef. It's uh, very low in fat and um, tastes good. So disclosures, uh, industry-sponsored trials I've been involved with uh, uh, both nationally and locally, but also you know, I think it's important to disclose what you do in professional activities that potentially could lead to biases or uh, agendas, but uh, um, it's been a great experience being on the TVT steering committee. Uh, uh, Joe Bavaria is now the chair, and Mike Mack and I are the stakeholders meeting. It's a very interesting group. We meet twice a year in DC with uh, an amazing group of people, the FDA, CMS, NIH, the heads of the various device companies, patient representatives, all the professional societies, and we talk about common issues. Uh, and that, that, that is an important aspect of the TVT registry. So just for those who are interested in skiing and other things, this is my uh, place up near the West Elk Wilderness. It's been an amazing year in terms of snowpack, um, and, uh, uh, and it's been cold. So, I was up the other weekend with my daughter and we went snowshoeing and it was, it hasn't had any melt so you just sank down. It's almost impossible to snowshoe because the snow is so deep and soft. These are three people who really uh, move this area in a unique uh, way. There are many more, like Dr. Reardon, having equal contributions. Um, it was the meeting between these three people uh, before TAVR was released, when it was going through the FDA, saying, we need to do things differently uh, with the rollout of this technology. We need to make it um, go right. Um, and uh, so my hat's off to the three of them for laying the groundwork uh, of how this transformative therapy rolled out. Um, and it led, the professional societies uh, put in a letter to CMS requesting a national coverage decision for TAVR, which establishes a national policy for reimbursement. And it's done under this uh, slogan of coverage with evidence development, meaning you know, we've got this new technology, we've had some pivotal trials, but now as it gets out into real world practice, we have to know how it works, 
Um, and certainly early on, event rates were quite high. And so this is a mechanism the government has, and CMS specifically, uh, to reimburse, but with a caveat. Um, and therefore, if you're going to develop evidence, you have to have a database, and that was the genesis of the um, Joint Professional Society uh, Registry. It also was about, let's roll it out in rational dispersion, and Ralph Brindis coined this term, rational dispersion, meaning when new therapies get out there, let's, how do we uh, make sure they start off in a good way, and that led to op operator and institutional requirements, including some volume requirements. Uh, early on, you didn't you'd have uh, sites with uh, outside of the investigative with TAVR experience, so you had to use other uh, volume uh, requirements. So the need for a clinical registry uh, was there, and we've turned the TVT registry into kind of a component of the U.S. learning healthcare system. I mean, we all learn from our own personal experience. What this registry does is it combines that and gives it a, a great power. And it allows us to develop a variety of different tools, predictive tools, but also performance tools and of, of how centers are doing and how they can improve. And it's been tightly integrated with the uh, regulatory process. Both the FDA uh, really stimulated uh, the development of this with Bram Zuckerman. And so TVT registry data have been used to expand indications, uh, which is very unique for a clinical uh, registry. So we've described uh, that in a variety of different articles. I'd never really had published before in health affairs. And just look at the co-authors here. You know, head of, uh, of uh, the FDA's uh, device group. Uh, Tamara's the head of the coverage group. You've got uh, people like Larry Wood, Richard Kunz, uh, Hernandez representing industry. Uh, and uh, Denicha is part of the FDA's uh, uh, epidemiology, so th that should communicate to you what a joint effort this has been to try to uh, learn as we evolve through that. Last summer, MedCAC, which is this uh, uh, Medicare Evidence Development and Coverage Advisory Committee, uh, was convened uh, rather suddenly by um, CMS to say, okay, we originally had a, a national coverage decision with a variety of different requirements, including volumes. Uh, are they still valid? You know, show us data about that, uh, and we'll come back to that in a minute. So the volume outcome relationship or asso association is something that uh, I think we all kind of intrinsically feel that, yes, uh, experience has an impact on outcomes, but it has a couple different formal aspects to it. One is, is learning a curve, where you can look at the sequential cases of an individual program or operator and see how you improve over time your outcomes. I think we all know that, whether you're in training or whether you're 40 years post-training, when you start something new, there is a, a learning process. But then there's another thing that in more uh, stable issues, uh, surgeries and procedures, then is there a relationship between the volume of an institution or operator um, and the, the outcomes? Um, sounds intrinsically simple, but it is in fact much more complex. Uh, and why has this analysis achieve such importance that they even would call a MedCAC meeting to look into uh, some of the data. Uh, well, it's, it's really having an influence. Uh, CMS is updating the national coverage decision for TAVR late of this March. They'll put out a draft in June after a public review comment period will be the final. And that will lay out the landscape of how CMS wants to or not wants to uh, regulate uh, TAVR in the U.S. Secondly, it is about clinical quality. Um, and if there's a strong volume outcome relationship, then you don't want policies, you don't want incentives that would encourage low volume programs to proliferate if their outcomes are significantly different from uh, larger volumes. And from a patient perspective of where do I go to have something done, uh, then you'd like to have that information too, which is obviously tightly linked to public reporting, which is, is coming for TAVR in the next year or so. 
But there's a lot more to it. Uh, medicine is not free of politics. There are issues of access that need to be addressed about healthcare disparities. And so you have the intersection of other things related to um, rolling out new technologies. And then there's an industry uh, perspective. The US market is the most profitable for medical devices and um, to have a national coverage decision is basically telling industry, you can't take your product and sell it to anyone. You've got to, uh, there's going to be some regulation of who does what. And what's going to happen with the national coverage decision with TAVR is probably going to be the blueprint uh, for other transcatheter therapies. As already there's a national coverage decision for uh, MitraClip that has to be updated because it was really restricted to degenerative. And so that's another important aspect. This is another interesting article in Health Affairs, something I, I think we've just recently, we keep hearing about drug prices in the US being significantly different from other countries around the world. It's the same with medical devices. Uh, the same technology uh, that cost $15,000 in uh, the EU uh, is twice as much in the States. Same technology. Uh, the government in the US does not negotiate, uh, so unlike in many European countries. And so as we've seen over the years, like Neil will know with drug eluding stents, the first couple people in the market were able to charge whatever they wanted, and it really took four or five different vendors before price competition brought that down. The traditional explanation has been uh, 475, why it takes many years to develop a new coffee. <laughs> and yes, the, invest, the, the investment to develop new technologies, new drugs is, is huge, and so it, it, it is uh, warranted that uh, there has to be some way of uh, payback for that huge investment. And we want to stimulate innovation. And so there is a balance between appropriate pricing and pricing that perhaps is unfair and places an undue burden on the US uh, consumers to uh, fund development of new drugs and devices. So to do a volume outcome analysis, um, for someone who's a non-statistician like me, you get rather awed by what's involved. Uh, it's complex. There are many choices how to do the analysis. First of all, the source of data. To do these analyses, you need a lot of data. And it has to be high quality, and it has to have multiple data elements to do different risk adjustments uh, that are appropriate. Uh, what outcome do you want to study? Do you want to look at, at uh, mortality, uh, complications, um, and the interesting thing, and just kind of an update on our recent analysis, is that we haven't seen a volume outcome relationship with stroke before or even in this current period. So what's that mean? Uh, um, that doesn't mean that experience may have something to do with outcome, but it's probably much less, and so we, we need new solutions like cerebral protection to reduce uh, stroke rates. Uh, when should it be out, uh, assessed? Uh, should you just do the procedure? The in-hospital, 30-day, we've certainly learned from the surgeons that 30-day outcomes are more valid uh, than just looking at in-hospital. But in something like uh, TAVR, uh, one-year outcomes are also very important, but go into more than just the skill of the team and go into broader issues like patient selection. How to characterize volume is not so straight uh, hospital-based, operator-based. Are you going to look at what we call case sequence, annual volumes? And how do you assess volume, the association? Uh, you can express volume as continuous versus a categorical uh, variable. And then how do you use that? Is a difference that is statistically significant uh, important clinically? And if it is, uh, then you have to balance with access. So additional challenge is to look at TAVR and its volume outcome relationship and other quality metrics is that it's such a dynamic field. Uh, number one, it's growing. And so these, we just uh, did a data run uh, in preparation for a stakeholders meeting. And so there are 51,000 TAVRs in the US 
performed in 2017 and through three quarters in 2018, already a little more. So it continues to grow. Um, and we don't have all the 2018 because the registry requires sites to submit their data uh, by about three months after the end of a quarter. So that's where we'll soon have the 2018 data, but you can extrapolate that's gonna be over 60,000 TAVRs, which compares to about 28,000 surgical AVRs uh, in the current era. It's, it's slightly down from a few previous years. It's sort of leveled off. And so the growth in TAVR has initially really been by patients who were just weren't being treated because they were high risk. But a lot of this more recent growth has been in the intermediate risk uh, expansion of indications. So the next phase is gonna be determined uh, by what this guy is going to present in the next couple of weeks in terms of the low risk trials. You know, what will the volume of TAVR be two years from now? 70,000, 80,000, we'll see. Another dynamic aspect has been the outcomes. Uh, so here we have in hospital, 30 day and one year. And one of the unique things about uh, the TVT registry is our collaboration with CMS. So they give us uh, access via linkage to their uh, follow-up data, which is important for long-term outcomes. They've been a little slow lately getting those, so we don't have the 2017 one year, but just, you know, you can really see the trend. And so you're getting down to fairly low 30-day um, uh, mortality which makes an analysis trying to differentiate site performance uh, more challenging. If you've got a lower frequency of, of events, then statistically it becomes a challenge. Easy to show these things when you've got very high event rates as in the early days. So uh, there are four studies that I'll, I'll review in the volume outcome relationship. The first was the one we published that was uh, rather dramatic in terms of the, in the uh, red is unadjusted outcomes and uh, the blue is adjusted. That is, we all know that the, the risks, the outcomes of surgery and procedures are related to patient characteristics as much as the skill of the team. And so you cannot uh, really compare uh, uh, outcomes between operators or institutions unless you risk adjust them, which is a fairly complex statistical uh, issue by itself. And so we showed statistically significant relationships in mortality, bleeding, and vascular complications, uh, but not stroke. And you can see the wide confidence uh, levels really drove that. And um, so that's, as I said before, one of the outcomes that does not seem to have a statistically significant uh, <laughs> relationship. But these results can be criticized as whether they're still relevant in 2019. Uh, volumes have dramatically increased. We've got, everyone's learned and there has been a lot of sharing of, of experience and that's what we want. Um, the number of sites since that report have gone to 385 to over 600 now. The original prediction was that there were gonna be about 400 sites uh, meeting the NCD. So we're a couple hundred above, and yes, that means that many sites have opened that probably don't meet uh, the NCD, which is interesting because the enforcement mechanism that CMS has on its hand is a rack audit, which is a pretty brutal uh, tool to enforce something. And so there hasn't been really enforcement of the national coverage decision. Uh, we certainly have had new generations of technology and we've had expansion to intermediate risk. And so all those factors have gone into this growth and make it uh, important to repeat these analyses to see if there's still a relationship. Well, internationally it has, was done and this report from last year from an international registry looked at both, uh, if we looked at the learning curve, you know, what are the outcomes uh, related to after your first one to 75 to a second level up to high to very high, greater than 300 experienced operators. Secondly, they looked at whether if you stratified sites by their annual volume, did you see a relationship with outcomes? And so they looked at procedure and 30 day clinical outcomes. And with a multivariate regression analysis, they were able to do some risk adjustment. And uh, these are 
just uh, raw, unadjusted clinical, but it's, uh, the same message was, was there, that as uh, p uh, programs were higher volume, uh, death, early safety endpoints, major bleeding had a significant uh, differential. We'll come back to major vascular complications. So that study concluded that there is an important learning curve. Uh, there is, in fact, also a, uh, a low a volume outcome relationship uh, that has clear associations with procedural safety and uh, patient mortality. And they thought they uh, showed an inflection point around 50 patients a year uh, to really uh, be uh, in a volume uh, that your outcomes were, were better. And uh, so that was an international study. It was over a broad time frame, so it did include this whole uh, rapid development of the field, changing technology, and so it could be criticized on that viewpoint. More recently, uh, Russo and, and co-authors did their own analysis, and, and this is kind of unique. Uh, you have to understand a few things. First of all, the TVT registry has industry partners, and every quarter, TVT registry data are downloaded to industry on their devices. You don't get your competitors, but you get all the data from the tens of thousands of patients who've received your uh, device. And so that was mainly for them to internally do uh, a look at their devices and also to m meet their post-approval study requirements from the FDA. Uh, Edwards was rather aggressive in trying to use it uh, in a broader sense and, and kind of the hypothesis of what was done here was that the Sapien 3 technology is so easy to use and well designed that there's no learning curve and no volume outcome relationship. That was what they basically proposed. And so the analysis uh, performed all Sapiens, S3 alone, and, uh, and then uh, S3 in sites that were naive. First of all, in all sapiens, they did show a basically a learning curve, and they talked about learning curve termination after a case sequence of around 200, which is interesting thought that uh, that goes away. But that's so that's for all sapien cases. But then they showed a volume outcome analysis for Sapien 3 only. That's our latest generation uh, device. And so here's the number of implants per month, a different way of expressing volume, uh, where there's no uh, statistical association with mortality or with stroke. Uh, and uh, secondly, then they showed uh, that if you looked at the case sequence, that is uh, all sites, their first, second, third, uh, cases, uh, there was no uh, learning curve. You know, there, there should be, should go down like this if there was a learning curve uh, phenomenon. And so what they concluded was for all Sapien models, after a case experience of 200 cases, there was learning curve termination. And subsequent to that initial learning curve analysis, there was no volume outcome relationship that persisted. And with sort of Sapien 3, Right out of the get-go, there was no learning curve, no demonstrable volume outcome relationship. And therefore, uh, with the current generation balloon expandable TAVR, i.e. Sapien 3, uh, centers should expect to achieve consistently excellent outcomes even during early case experience. Uh, and it's sort of a mixture of science and marketing um, in a publication. So you can critique uh, that study uh, in many ways. Um, number one, the way they classified experience of sites was they only had access to uh, sites uh, sapien volume. And so obviously some sites, especially sites that used more the self-expanding core valve series uh, were considered uh, low experience or no experiences. So, so that, that was an odd way that would uh, wipe out uh, differences in true experience. Um, secondly, they excluded the highest risk patients, which I don't understand. Uh, emergent cases, which comprise us not an insignificant number of TAVRs being performed, and often it is in those more critically ill, complex issues where you really see differentiation 
of skill levels of not only the operators, but in the post-procedure care in these people where often mortality is uh, linked to non-cardiac issues as much as cardiac and procedure issues. Secondly, they, their, their risk adjustment uh, was rather um, um, anemic in that they used the STS uh, predicted uh, mortality, which we know in TAVR is not very accurate. You can easily you know, have an STS score of three, but that 85-year-old who's frail, uh, has a porcelain aorta, blah, 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 um, is not an STS risk of three uh, mortality. So that uh, also would mute out any differences in uh, risk. And then they did a very unusual thing. The learning curve analysis was performed for S3 cases without consideration for prior balloon expandable valve experience. So that means someone like uh, Raj Makar at Cedars, uh, his first Sapien 3 case would be considered his first case and not include the thousand other patients he had done. So that's crazy because that's, uh, totally takes away the true experience of an operator and kind of, and, and so all these things can go into flattening any kind of learning curve or volume outcome relationship. And it was, uh, I thought, uh, pretty much a, a, a marketing because it sort of stayed with this technology, there's no learning curve, there's no volume outcome relationship. So if anyone else shows a learning curve or a volume outcome relationship in current TAV or practice, Guess what? It's the inferior core valve product that's driving that, not the Sapien 3. So here's a continued access, low risk uh, patient um, and uh, nice uh, deployment. Uh, looks like it's in a good position. Unfortunately, immediately the patient becomes hypotensive and you don't see it too well, uh, but in this picture, you do. You can see obliteration of the left sinus of Alsalva, and you can see uh, severe left main stenosis and the dye hung up there. And despite uh, having the presence of a, of a surgeon, the patient uh, died. So uh, the prediction of coronary, uh, the risk of acute coronary occlusion is challenging. Um, and it's very relevant now because there's a procedure to prevent that. It goes by the uh, uh, basilica, where you split with radio frequency a, the, the cusp that the, the leaflet that may be uh, thrown up by the TAVR valve and obstruct a coronary artery, and it splits it. So, like fortuitously, the coronary os fall, falls between those two. And I just reviewed the Basilica manuscript, and it's hard to predict this. Uh, you know, that we use CT. Many of you doing imaging know how important the, that's one of the things that you look at. And um, to predict it uh, is often not very easy. And to just have a pre-wire and have a coronary stent may be OK. But boy, you'd have to place a stent out the stovepipe and uh, that's why the basilica uh, procedure may be uh, um, important. But lowest trials, I'm waiting to hear Dr. Reardon's and Marty Leon's presentations at ACC. Undoubtedly, there'll be very low event rates, but um, you know, for someone with an STS predicted mortality that's actually valid of one or two percent, you know, we can't have too many coronary occlusions. Uh, in the TAVR, uh, and maybe this patient should have had SAVR instead uh, because of their risk, but uh, this was an experienced site. Uh, so there are some things that are hard to predict that we need to think about. So um, at MedCAC, um, we had to scramble to produce some new data looking at the more contemporary practice of TAVR in the United States to see if there was any relationship with the volume outcome. And so there was a preliminary analysis done by the Duke Clinical Research uh, Group. And so against when event rates fall 
for a single outcome, then one way to dealing that is do a composite where you have major vascular bleeding, uh, complications, major bleeding, mortality. And uh, so site annual volume did have a, a very clear uh, relationship to this uh, composite uh, uh, measure that uh, um, uh, is germane to the uh, argument. Likewise, uh, doing a more complex analysis, here's hospital death, the uh, actual observed rate. Down here we have the uh, annualized volume of, of hospitals, and you can see the different uh, breakdowns. And so we see a clear uh, fall in mean values. And this is uh, kind of a quick and dirty way of risk adjusting, doing an ODE uh, uh, ratio. So with both analyses, we see this, just what the data show, a uh, relationship between uh, volume and outcome and in the ODE. So we were able to put this together rather quickly for the purposes of MedCAC. Uh, and another thing that becomes pretty obvious is that at, uh, low volume sites, uh, there is a statistical challenge of uh, fairly assessing their quality in both directions. You know, just think, if you do 20 procedures and you have two deaths, <laughs> you're really, you know, looking very terrible relative to uh, other sites. And that just may be the bad luck. Uh, and uh, likewise, you might have very good luck and have no deaths in the first 20. And all of a sudden, you look better than Houston Methodist, that, than anyone else. But is it real? Uh, is it after another year of experience, does that persist? No, those, that statistically based uh, variability uh, starts going away, as you can see by the narrower and narrow confidence levels as volumes go up. So uh, this is not something that's new to TAVR. Certainly with surgical procedures and surgical AVRs, you know, a site does five surgical AVRs, they can have zero, or they could have 50%, or not 50% if it's only five, but uh, if they did 10 and five died, that would be 50%. So and I have to apologize. I expected by this time that uh, our updated uh, volume outcome uh, manuscript would be published, and it will be published in, in March, I expect, but it is embargoed, so we take embargoes very seriously, so I can't present the data. But I can present how we, we looked at the problem. Number one, we looked at all TAVR procedures performed between January 1 and December 31st, because that really includes the latest technology. It's uh, all the learning that had gone on in the previous few years. Uh, the expansion of indications to intermediate risk. So it's really the, the group we want to look at, the time period. Secondly, uh, we looked, the primary outcome was risk-adjusted 30-day mortality by continuous analyzed volume of transfemoral TAVR. Because that uh, TVT registry shows that transfemoral TAVR is now done 94% of the time. The need for alternative access is down to 6%. In the first several years of TAVR in the United States, alternative access was used 46% of the time because they were big tubes and we couldn't get them, that those big tubes in these uh, arteries of small or elderly uh, people. Um, and uh, we also looked at uh, category variables, but uh, it's not as good uh, because you can, you can blur differences when you start pre producing bins of, of volume. So the continuous is the more uh, valid. Uh, we've performed and will be published uh, more. We also looked at alternative access. And, and so, you know, can't show you the results, but there is a volume outcome relationship of both TAVR done transfemorally and alternative access. We actually also did an analysis of valve and valve where we didn't see, we saw a, a similar trend, but it was not statistically significant, probably because site volume for valve and valve is so low that it's uh, hard to uh, really have the statistical power to show that. We also, in response to reviewers, looked at operator. Um, and uh, the results were similar to hospital-based assessment of that. 
Uh, you know, we've been hesitant to do operator-based because, as you know, TAVR is not a one operator procedure. It's really a team effort. And um, so uh, we'll, we'll, we put both out, out there uh, with good results. And then we did what's called a sensitivity analysis. Okay. Gee, isn't it unfair to use the outcomes of a program or an operator in their first year? You know, I don't believe that there's no learning curve with any technology. It, it just can't, uh, it's only one component of what determines the, the outcome of a procedure. And so we started excluding cases for six months and 12 months, and a volume outcome relationship persisted. So it's one way of trying to separate learning curve from a volume outcome relationship after you have uh, more stability and remove that, uh, those uh, brutal early days of, of, of learning. For a patient, it doesn't matter. Uh, their outcome you know, uh, is what it is, and they don't care whether it's your learning curve or your volume outcome relationship. So stay tuned for some compelling results. So the other flip side of this whole is access. And that's part of quality of care. You, you, you cannot, you know, an 85-year-old, uh, how are they going to travel a couple hundred miles down to a tavern site? Um, and families, individuals don't have the financial means to fly around to the meccas in Houston or elsewhere in the country. They have to stay locally. So access is very, very important. And, but it's complex. But there are over 600 sites. I think it's 605 as of last week um, around the country. And it, it really, the population density map just overlays this pretty exactly. And I'm happy to report up in Wyoming, which had no sites, there is now a site that's getting up and running in Casper, uh, which is good. It's good because here, this is one of our patients uh, who came down to Denver to be treated. And so he is in the oil industry and uh, he has a variety of other medical conditions that made him uh, higher risk. And so he had TAVR, but this article was all about you know, he had to travel. And this guy could travel, but if you, it's an 85-year-old, um, that, that's a big distance. Uh, it's about 275 miles between Casper and uh, Denver. So... Um, but he should be designed on the highway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, also, good marketing by Edwards. You know, they give everyone a little model to take home and show it to their buddies in the oil fields. Um, so how do we compare in the US to other countries? So these are data that I, I put together. And so just two columns. Here's the countries. And TAVR sites per population 65 and older. That's really the demographic. If you do all the populations, you know, aortic stenosis is predominantly a degenerative disease. Yes, it's bicuspid, but uh, the vast majority of people with aortic stenosis are over the age uh, 65. So United Kingdom, okay, a health service, so maybe they don't have good access. Uh, France is, is a bit better. Uh, Netherlands, Germany, where it's less regulated. Uh, that, look, so U.S. got one tower site for 83,000 seniors. Is that enough? Do we need more? What about uh, in the largest uh, 10 US states? How is the distribution of TAVR? Where, again, here are the states, uh, total population ranked, and I put in Colorado here for my own agenda, and number of residents over 65 per TAVR site. So here's the number of TAVR sites. It's a little out of date. I think I put this together last summer, and there have been about 30 more sites added. And so we see uh, there's a fair amount of variation. Uh, what is the number of tower sites appropriate to serve patient needs? Not to serve the competitive needs of different healthcare systems that are going after uh, market share, but to serve the patients. And so you can see what problem I'm dealing with is that we have more tower sites per elderly population than many other uh, states. So that's another look at that. 
What about in Texas? So I put this together for Mike Mack. Uh, and, and again, it, there may be a couple new sites uh, where uh, for the same population base between Dallas, Fort Worth, and Houston, Woodlands, Sugarland, being quite similar, you guys have four, and up there they have 11. So it's, it's interesting, and, and healthcare systems may uh, you know, consolidate services, but as I've heard from Neil, you guys are under pressure to have more of your uh, sister hospitals open to our sites. What's the right answer? You know, again, is it patient need? Is it serving underserved uh, populations? The group that reop that put the letter into CMS to reopen uh, the uh, NCD, saying we need to relax uh, the, the uh, requirements, uh, was not a Wyoming hospital. It was a hospital in suburban LA, serving a predominantly upper middle class population, and they're surrounded by other TAVR programs. So the median annual hospital transfemoral TAVR volume at the end of 2017 was 54 cases. Half of them doing less than 54, a quarter of them doing less than 23. Which 20 was the uh, NCD requirement for annual volume. And you could see the intense pressure hospitals are under to stay competitive with the latest treatments that sometimes they'll just say, well, uh, they're, they're risking reimbursement uh, from a CMS. They're risking a RAC audit, but they weigh the need to be competitive and not have uh, their surgical program, whatever. Uh, so it's intense. So on this committee, the recommendation was based on volume outcome and other data that, you know, that a, a TAVR program that exists should be doing 50 cases a year to maintain high, high quality. And uh, very clearly in this document, it said lower volume programs shouldn't be closed. Yes, we need to move to an assessment of quality, direct quality metrics, not simply volume. Agreed, agreed, agreed. You got to deal with the statistical uncertainty, though, of assessing that program that does 15 cases a year. And if you're a patient or a family member, you know that it's a dilemma you're under of of, of knowing what a uh, hospital outcomes are. Public reporting has not yet started in TAVR. It is. You need a valid, valid quality metric, though, and that, that is uh, being developed. In fact, we're, well, our, half of the group, is, our surgeons and STS has really done an amazing job over the years of coming up with performance metrics. And for surgical AVR, they have a star rating system that it is a composite of, of uh, adverse events, and you know, one star is not very good, two is average, and three is uh, better than average, and that's the way the TAVR metric will go, and it's likely CMS is going to incorporate that into the NCD because they are under intense pressure to move away from volume requirements to quality metrics, but with those caveats that I've mentioned. So this in the document, we put together, okay, here's TAVR site volume, and here's uh, clinical outcomes, acceptable, poor, low, medium, high, and you can adjust these to whatever uh, metric you, you want. And, uh, and there's also a great article by Greg uh, Damer, uh, along with Mike Mack, and uh, others about this. And so if you're a high volume program and you've got suboptimal outcomes that are risk adjusted with national benchmarks and your 95% confidence levels, you're off, you've got a problem. Yeah, there's no statistical excuses you can use and you gotta do something about that. Right now, there's no, it's up to sites. They get their quarterly reports from the TVT registry with national benchmarks, and it's up to the site to do something. Should there be some 
organization that overviews that don't know. If you've got low volumes and acceptable outcomes, yeah, you may be really a good program, no doubt about that, but it may be also the luck of the draw. And so, you know, you've got to continue to look at that. If you've got low volumes and unacceptable programs, well, you may have a quality issue. Um, it could be random sampling, but these are the challenges uh, we're dealing with as society, as trying to find how do we improve care of these patients. So this is the uh, uh, Damer with Ralph Brendes, Dave Shaheen. Um, he's an amazing guy. He's a surgeon at Mass General uh, who really uh, understands the statistics and the outcomes and helped develop a lot of the SDS risk models. And of course, uh, Mike. And the, Volume is not the only key thing to look at. I mean, it is, there are many components that determine the quality of care, and access is one of them, appropriateness, uh, patient preference. There are a lot of different components, so no one's trying to say that, hey, volume, volume, volume. No, not, a, not at all, but it is one thing that we have to look at. So right now, and at MedCAC, this came out. It was, it was an intense meeting of conflicting viewpoints. One, say, access is the issue. Uh, it, we need to have uh, not a tavern site in every corner, but no regulation. Just remove it or make it so low that uh, you know, we'll have 1,000 tavern sites. Don't know. The other. Uh, viewpoint is that there should be some center of excellence model that you've got to demonstrate high quality and we've you see that throughout medical care other models transplant etc where uh, the center of excellence model makes sense so how does this play out so again just to give you an overview randomized clinical trials lead to fda approval of novel treatment technology cms then makes the policy decision that they want to learn more about it they'll cover it for the time being they'll learn more about it and at some point they'll terminate the ncd and we don't expect it this round but probably the next round they may terminate it and what will be in place will then determine how TAVR and all the other valve therapies will though. It could be a, tr a transition to accreditation-based tiered systems of care, or it could be unregulated dispersion by market forces, which is unique in the United States. You know, you compare healthcare systems, we've got a hyper-competitive uh, system. Uh, so in conclusions, there's still evidence and please wait for the publication that there is, uh, there are, certainly volume uh, outcome relationships. Uh, the threshold is somewhat arbitrary. 50 cases per year, one doing one TAVR a week seems to be uh, uh, supported. Um, we want low volume sites to grow. The biggest threat is opening more sites around them. And then you just dilute the volume and that's not good. And allowing more sites uh, will potentially compromise quality of care. You know, if you've got 2% uh, mortality down to 1% with volume grows, yeah, you may make the treatment more accessible, but you're trading off something. Bottom line is we do need to on goes uh, to develop better metrics about site performance and have everyone improve, not close down sites uh, unless they really are poor. Uh, and that's where we want to go. So uh, we collect the data, but we don't monitor, do anything with sites in terms of uh, helping them improve their performance. Uh, and we'll see how CMS deals with that issue. That's one of, in my mind, one of the biggest unknowns of how they're going to deal with this, this issue. Because yeah, you can make the transition to quality metrics, but if there's no enforcement or there's no oversight of it, then it'll be like the first NCD, some places will just ignore it. So questions, and I'll close with uh, Colorado. Uh, this is building 500. This is on the Fitzsimmons former army base that the University of Colorado picked up 500 acres through the Base Closure Act. And this, for cardiovascular history buffs, building 500 is important. 
Ike was ma married to Mamie. Mamie was from Colorado. They took vacations out there. Ike, one day in 1955, was playing golf, the Cherry Creek Golf Course, and started having pain. The professional, the presidential physician was a gastroenterologist. <laughs> so you know what the diagnosis was. So Ike went back to Mamie's parents' house, started having chest pain through the night. There was no STEMI call back then. And it was the middle of the Cold War. So finally, they brought a portable ECG to the parents' house. He was having huge anterior MI. But to have the President of the United States in a stretcher in the middle of the Cold War, so he had to walk out to the car, and they drove him out to Fitzsimmons. And on the top floor, they t the Secret Service took over, and he, he was in there for six weeks, which was fast track for acute MI care back then. So anyway, this is the campus, this is the new uh, building, uh, and Phil Anschutz is a benefactor who's given about a billion dollars to build that. And that's Ike uh, recovering down in the right corner. Thank you, and happy to ask, answer questions. Yeah, Neil? Well, <laughs> and that's me riding a horse. So that, How do we know that's you? <laughs> I mean, we know there's a horse, but I mean, that, you know, that could be anyone. That, that could be Dr. Zogby. It, no, yeah. uh, anyway, um, those of us who sat in the front uh, realized this was an amazing lecture. Um, you know, even to those of us who are well plugged in, uh, you had some amazing insights that we hadn't uh, hadn't thought of. So I'd like to open things up for questions. Looks like Dr. Reardon's raring to go. Uh, surgeons are always raring to go. Well, John, thank you for an absolutely stunning lecture and all you've done for this field. You know, the, the, the problem we have, of course, is, is once we try to go beyond TAVR, this applies to everything. So the average heart surgeon does eight or eight valves a year. The average heart surgeon does five micro repairs a year. And the market was supposed to sort those out. Yeah. The problem is, is it's very hard for people to understand what real quality is in, in the market because it's really not that easy to measure medicine, you know, other than deaths are really hard endpoints. Yeah. What's your own personal feeling about where this is going to sort out? Mm. Well, uh, I wish I knew. Um, number one, we are dealing with almost 20% of, of the U.S. Uh, GDP. DP going to healthcare and it's rising and we're going to go broke and things like redundant services and very expensive things like hybrid ORs uh, we just can't have redundancy and the cost so there I think there is going to be an economic factor that starts entering in secondly the healthcare systems <clears throat> the, the big ones are starting to consolidate some Somewhat, there are fewer surgical programs, which is a big change. Uh, but um, they're, they, they see the economics of needing to consolidate high-end treatment programs to uh, a few hospitals, and, and so there may be that trend. But we are in a uh, healthcare systems where, where healthcare system where it's very competitive, and so you've got this contrary force. So I don't know, Mike, how it's going to, to play out. And I'm not sure how much CMS is going to have the guts to lay down uh, the line um, and do things. There are truly access problems in Wyoming, and, and I'm happy to see that. But a lot of the other, there's not access programs in suburban um, uh, Chicago, or, or you name it. That's just not issue. And you can make the argument that, yes, we have health care disparities in the U.S., but they're complex what the nature is, and they're not going to be solved by Larry Woods opening a TAVR program in every community. So that's my editorialization without knowing how this is going to play out. Do you have any thoughts, Mike? Well, I don't know. I mean, our three of our four are right in a row right here, and Larry actually came to me to lobby for me to try to go get rid of any restrictions, because Larry would like one on every every corner. Yeah. 
I, I mean, I've, I've, I'm selfishly in somewhat favor of centers of excellence because that's what we do. We think we can teach and we can do it better. Um, you know, I, I think it's going to be some hybrid of those things. What other interests me is that you didn't talk about operators. Right yeah. now, we require two operators. Every time I see Danny DeVere, he tells me he doesn't need a surgeon and wants to eliminate <laughs> surgeons. You know, what's going to happen with operators in the next three, three or four years? Well, I think the partnership between surgery and cardiology has been just amazing. I mean, any of you who are around 20 years ago, you know, we, we, we often had more contentious, although at Colorado we had the head of surgery, Fred Grover, who used to talk about coronary disease. It's just a matter of who's going to do cabbage first, then PCI, PCI, cabbage. It's, it's a joint. So uh, I think my involvement as surgeons has been profoundly useful. And I showed that acute coronary occlusion because if that occurred at a place where you didn't have ECMO, if you weren't standing next to a surgeon uh, who could do something about that, uh, the outcome uh, is guaranteed as, as bad. John, what a pleasure having you. And, and you're the person who really has uh, your finger on the pulse of this because you see, you see the data coming. And I have a few thoughts. One, uh, TAVR and structure of a particularly TAVR really resurrected the concept of a heart team. Yeah. And along the lines of you know, some of the newer requests of having a single operator, et cetera. I'm, I'm not talking about an operator. You need, you know, as you expanded beyond Taver, you need an imager. I mean, it, it is really a team and a complex kind of right. situation. Uh, it is interesting from the data that you showed that one, a quarter of these sites, and it has expanded beyond the initial expectations of 400, more 600, quarter of these sites do barely almost the minimum or close to where the thresholds looks like where, where it would be, at least from the data available yeah. at this stage of the game. So just about from the sheer number and maybe the outcomes that looks like at least number-wise in the nation. So the other question to you is, are we covering the major cities? Yes, Wyoming just really covered. I mean, is it over, already covered? Uh, you know, you, you can't have a shop open for every little city in the United States. And those distances will always be there. And interestingly enough, the vast majority, at least of this condition, is not an emergency condition, yeah. the vast majority. So uh, I think that's the argument for maybe we're, we're uh, achieved a certain threshold of volume of sites, maybe 700 or something like this, but a quarter of them are barely reaching it despite competitiveness, despite, despite a lower threshold that you have to be above it. Yeah, no, excellent points. Um, and uh, you know, it is true that the uh, dispersion of knowledge uh, has been very effective. Uh, so certainly low volume sites get a lot of support and, and industry has been great of sending really excellent clinical reps. And if you need a proctor, they're there. And that's clearly muted a lot of what could otherwise be pretty brutal days for uh, certain uh, programs and certainly for the, the patients uh, within them. And if we have expansion of indication to low risk, then we would hope that all sites will gain more uh, volume. Um, but if we open another 500 TAVR sites, then that would just undo that. And so uh, we'll, we'll see how things e evolve. And I think it's a fascinating thing for us to look at and for everyone to understand the unique aspects of our healthcare system and, and the challenges of measuring quality. And uh, it's, it's, uh, but it's something we, we need to do. And, and the, the TVT registry really has been a great source of collaboration including with industry. I mean, there's no doubt that it's been, one of the things we wanted to do is we wanted to lower the time for new treatments to be approved in the US to bring them to our patients. And it has acted as that catalyst, getting the same people in the room to sort out how to do that. Well, thank you all, it's been great to be here.
Hey. Like, the worst call me, like, we're starting at this gym. Get up here quick. So, I really enjoyed it. Really great. I did.